Okay, folks, we have two more sections left in Isaiah 53. So this is the second to last, which would mean it's the fourth. Uh, however, it's the fifth study because we did a week of an overview. Uh, we're looking at verses 7 through 9 of Isaiah 53. Uh, remember, each section has its own theme. This section's theme is the submission of the servant. Um, in these verses today, we learn how the suffering servant will respond to the suffering he's going to experience. In these verses today, we're going to learn how the servant responds to the suffering he's going to receive and experience and walk through. That's what we're going to learn today. His response is that of submission and silence. Not fighting against it, not running from it, but the suffering that the servant will experience, endure, walk through, um, he will do so submissively and silently to the Father's will. Although Isaiah wrote this prophetically, I can't help but read it historically. I read this, I would imagine you do too, and you think of Jesus. So as we read this, we will, it will become abundantly clear yet again who he's talking about. In fact, uh, this is the passage that the Ethiopian eunuch in Acts 8 was reading when Philip hopped up in the chariot and told him, hey, you know what you're reading? He's like, well, how can I read if somebody doesn't explain it? Who is he talking about? Philip says he's talking about Jesus of Nazareth. So this is the passage that the Ethiopian eunuch was reading when God converted him. So in these verses, uh, we see in verse 7 that the servant was silent in the face of affliction. In verse 8, we will see that the servant was executed as a substitute. Yet again, this theme of substitutionary atonement bubbling up that's, that's weaved throughout the entire passage, uh, chapter. And then in verse 9, we see that the servant was innocent in his death. Let's go to verse 7. Actually, I'll read all three verses first, and then we'll go back to verse 7. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off? out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgressions of my people. And they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. So verse 7, he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. Charles Simeon, um, wrote of this passage regarding Jesus' silent submissiveness to his Father. Charles Simeon wrote of this passage regarding Jesus' silent submissiveness to his Father. He said, As a sheep, when their shearer is stripping it of its clothing, makes neither noise nor resistance. And as a lamb who prances about even while being driven to the slaughter, and licks the very hand that is lifted to slay it. So our blessed Lord endured all his sufferings silently, willingly and with expressions of love to his Father. Silent, submissive servant. Now, we see this silent component in Jesus of Nazareth, when he stands before Pilate in John 18. Turn with me to John 18. Real quick, keep your, keep your finger, of course, in Isaiah 53, because we're going to come back to it. But ju jump with me to John 18, and let's see an example of how Isaiah's prophetic comment here regarding the servant's silence appeared in Jesus of Nazareth, specifically above, uh, in front of Pilate. Eighteen. 
We're going to look at verse 33 through 36. And his silence, we're going to see he's ver- he will verbally speak, uh, but what he's speaking is not what I would have spoken if I'm in his position. Let me say that, right? John 18, verse 33. So Pilate entered his headquarters again and called Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you say this of your own accord, or did others say it to you about me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you over to me. What have you done? Stop there for a minute. If I'm before Pilate, I'm saying, Nothing! I'm innocent. I'm innocent. I haven't done anything. I shouldn't be here. I'm dark. I shouldn't be getting beaten and crucified. I'm innocent. That's what I'd say. That's not what he says. His silence is evident even in his verbal answer. He's, he's not claiming his innocence. Verse 36, Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the the Jews. But my kingdom is not of this world. So again, he's silent. I'm not, I'm not, right? Not in that moment. I didn't do anything. I sound like my sons when they do something they're not supposed to do. What did you do? I didn't do anything. (laughs) He truly didn't do anything. Truly innocent. Now, Jump back to Isaiah 53. Some people say that Jesus did open his mouth in complaining, with a complaining heart when he's on the cross. Let me say that again. Some people would say that Jesus did open his mouth with a complaining heart when he cries out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I would challenge them as to whether they're correctly interpreting his heart here. Um, I don't believe he was complaining as much as he was overwhelmed with grief from the separation between him and the Father. So he's overwhelmed with grief. grief. He was pleading for, for the divine fellowship that he and the Father had had for eternity that was now broken. And we can't miss why it was broken. That divine fellowship of love was replaced with divine wrath between the Father and the Son because of you. And when I say that, I'm not trying to make you feel guilty. You're already guilty. I don't need to make you feel guilty. I'm already guilty. But the reality is that grief that filled his heart should have been filling our hearts. But there was no complaining. There was no whining. There was no, I'm running from this. There was submissive silence. I mean, even the people that nailed Jesus to the cross, he didn't threaten them. Instead, he prayed, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And even on top of that, after he was raised from the dead, Jesus tells his disciples to go and proclaim the gospel to the very people whose blood, his blood, was on their hands. Silent, submissive, filled with love. This is is the passage that Peter has in mind in 1 Peter. Jump to 1 Peter real quick. We're going to do this jumping around, I think, two more times. No, nope, this is... This is the last time. 1 Peter chapter 2. With this passage in mind, Isaiah 53, Peter brings forward the reality of Jesus' silence in the face of affliction and says that it's a model for how we as Christians are to face our affliction and persecution. Let me say that again. Thinking of Isaiah 53, Peter has this passage in mind as he brings forward the reality that we as Christians should follow in the servant's footsteps regarding 
when we're faced with affliction and persecution. He says in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 21, For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example, so that you might not follow in his steps. So that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. So in the face of persecution and affliction, we are to, we are to continue to entrust ourselves to the Father. We are to trust God and not revile, not argue, not ridicule the ones that the persecution and affliction is coming from. So Peter uses this Isaiah 53 passage to teach us um, that we are to walk in Jesus' footsteps regarding our affliction, submissively, silently, and trusting ourselves to the Father. Amen? Beautiful. Move on to verse 8 of Isaiah 53. Now we're going to see the servant was executed as a substitute. We've talked about this several times. It's the gospel. It's the reality of his substitutionary atonement. He steps into our place, takes the punishment on himself that we deserve. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. So it appears that Isaiah here makes a reference to the trial of the servant here at the beginning part of this. Um, that he would stand trial, and this so-called trial would be unjust, marked with oppression and unjust judgment. The unjust trial would result in the servant being taken away, like you would see uh, somebody in a courtroom, right, being after the guilty uh, verdict is read, he's taken away. Um, but this taken away goes directly into the ex execution because he says, cut off out of the land of the living. So the term cut off out of the land of the living is a common Hebrew expression that refers to being violently killed. Isaiah is clearly predicting here that the servant is going to be killed. Think about that. That this one, Isaiah 53, remember, the Jews see this as the messianic prophecy. All the way up until... I think it was the 1100s, I think I said. Jews believe this is the Messianic prophecy, and that's when they switched it to believe that. But during Jesus' time, they believed Isaiah 53 was a Messianic prophecy. Okay. It says then that he will be cut off out of the land of the living. He will be killed. But they just didn't see it. We know why, because God has, hadn't opened their eyes to see it. We talked about this this week in another devotion, that he blinds, all of us are blind, and he will give eyes to see to those that he chooses to give eyes to see. But think about it. The, the Jews are thinking the Messiah is going to come in power and destroy Rome when the book that they would call their scriptures says right in front of them, no, the Messiah is going to come and get cut out of, off out of the land of the living. How do they not know? It's because God had not given them eyes to see. We could read this back and forth, upside down a million times. And unless the Lord, by the power of his Holy Spirit, opens our eyes to see it, we won't see it. That's what the Holy Spirit does with the word. It causes us to see it. I tried reading it before I was saved. Couldn't. Made no sense. No desire. It's amazing. But man, oh man, I love it now. That's evidence of the residence of the Holy Spirit abiding in me. So that's why that they were, they, it was right in front of them. But they were blind because God had not given them sight. Now this idea of being cut off, again, in, it, we see it in Daniel 9, verse 26, talking about the Messiah says, and after the 62 weeks, an anointed one shall be cut off and shall have nothing. So again, this anointed one 
uh, this Messiah being cut off out of the land of the living, killed. So let's talk about this, this, uh, this unjust judge, unjust trial. I mean, Jesus miraculously healed sick people, fed thousands of people miraculously, yet Jesus received the exact kind of trial that Isaiah is talking about, this unjust, oppressive trial, this unfair trial. That's exactly what Christ walked through. And so what does Isaiah mean when he says, and for his generation, who considered? What does he mean here? Well, I think Isaiah is referencing the fact that no one in Jesus' generation even considered the injustice that was taking place. Pilate even said, I find no fault in this man, but then hands him over to be executed. I mean, where? Nobody. Nobody would step in and say, wait a minute, pump the brakes. He's innocent. He heals sick people. He's done, wait, this is not fair. Nobody in the generation did it. There were no protests with their signs. Jesus, nobody was claiming that Jesus got a fair trial or an unfair trial. Nobody was saying that. Where was Nicodemus and the other upright religious leaders? Where were his disciples? Nobody in his generation said, this trial is unjust, this is unfair. In fact, the crowds were screaming the opposite. Crucify him, crucify him. Give us the, the murderous Barabbas instead. Disciples, gonzo. And that right there is another Old Testament prophecy fulfilled. Zechariah 13.7 predicted, strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. That's exactly what happened, right? Boom, gone, leave them. So at the end of verse 8, we see Isaiah again reiterates the substitutionary atonement. Stricken for the transgressions of my people, Christ steps into our place and receives the punishment that our transgressions deserve. A substitutionary atonement again. But what does he mean by my people? Stricken for the transgressions of my people. Is he talking about all Jews? Only Jews? Where he was then I would ask the question, was I was Jesus stricken for the transgressions of Caiaphas? No. Judas? No. I don't think he's talking about Jewish eth ethnic Jews specifically. I think he's talking about Jews and Gentiles that are part of the redeemed, whose names are written in the book of life, which were written before the foundation of the world. <clears throat> My people, I think Isaiah is speaking from a perspective of those that are his people, the Christ's people, both Jew and Gentile, black and white, rich and poor, doesn't matter. Anyone whom the Father pulls out of darkness and gives to the Son. That's good news. So, verse 9, we finish um, with the, the, the truth regarding the servant and his, he was innocent in his death. So we said silent, um, we said he was executed as a substitute, now he's, the reality of his innocence now is found in verse 9. And they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. So again, um, Old Testament prophecies, there are a plethora of them that Christ fulfills. Um, amazingly detailed prophecies, we see one in front of us here. Uh, these details, um, these detailed prophe prophecies bring to our mind the reality of God's sovereignty, that only a God outside of time could orchestrate the events in time that perfectly fulfill things that were written times before, right? 
hundreds of years before. And so we see one such unlikely prophecy fulfilled in verse 9 regarding Jesus' death and burial. And they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death. Now Isaiah provides details around the servant's death and burial, specifically that it's marked by two things, wicked and a rich man. Okay, let's talk about the first one. Uh, We know that Jesus was crucified as if he was a wicked man, and he was crucified alongside two wicked men. Amen? So what about this rich man? We also read, um, and we read in John 19, where we see a man named Joseph of Arimathea takes Jesus' body and buries it in his new tomb. Now, the fact that it was a new tomb um, means that this Joseph has wealth. He's wealthy. He had his own tomb. It was new. And in addition to that, when you see what, how they prepared Jesus' body, him and Nicodemus, Joseph, Joseph and Nicodemus, they used 75 pounds of myrrh and, and different um, aloes and whatnot. Those were extremely expensive, which means there's wealth there, right? It's interesting. Like, even those, those minute details, like, they're there, they're present. It's not, like, written, hey, look, this one actually fulfills, but it's, it's a shadow here that it's an allusion to the Isaiah 53 that makes it abundantly clear that there's another Old Testament fulfillment here. That um, the rich man in his death, that the servant um, is mentioned in this verse 9, meets its fulfillment in Joseph of Arimathea. Now, let's talk about the part where it says, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Now, this is really important. There's another Old Testament a reality here, not just in here in Isaiah 53, but this idea of um, one without blemish, no deceit, no violence, you know, perfect and sinless. It's mentioned in Exodus 12. God tells Moses to have the Israelites sacrifice a lamb for Passover, right? They're in Egypt. God tells them to sacrifice a lamb, spread the blood of the lamb over the doorpost. And the angel of death will come and pass over that house. And the Jewish people, the firstborn son in that house, will not die. But the lamb had to be without blemish, had to be spotless, sinless, perfect. If there was a lamb that was slain that, was, that had spots and was not um, perfect, then the, the angel of death would have come and killed the firstborn in the house. This is an exodus with Egypt. Um, so we see this, the, that the blood is from the spotless, unblemished lamb. Now this is why John the Baptist, when he sees Jesus, he proclaims the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Now that is right there, John the Baptist says. That is the unblemished, perfect, sinless with no deceit in his mouth, no violence in his mouth. That is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. It's making the connection to the Exodus uh, 12 passage we, we saw. And even Peter makes it abundantly clear. He ties it up, puts a bow on it, and it's done. Peter says in 1 Peter 1.19, regarding how... It teaches the ransom price for a guilty sinner to be passed over on Judgment Day and escape the punishment we deserve. He says in 1 Peter 1.19, the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. So that's why the servant is found with no deceit and violence in his mouth because he's sinless. That's why he goes through the suffering silently because there is no sin. Because he must be without blemish to be the sufficient sacrifice that does, in fact, take away our sin. Amen? If he was not without sin, without violence in his mouth, without deceit in his mouth, if he was not that way, he would not have been the sufficient sacrifice and would not have been the Messiah but he was and is. So that's good news. 
So we see in these verses here that the servant was silent in the face of affliction, was executed as a substitute, and was innocent in his death. We'll read these verses one last time and we'll pray. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And as for his generation, who consider that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people? And they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Let's pray. Lord, too often we find violence and deceit in our mouth in the face of affliction, persecution, difficult circumstances, and we repent of that. Uh, that's the reality uh, of our situation, and we don't want it to be. We want to be sanctified uh, by your Holy Spirit and through your word, being faithfully taught, so that we too would be uh, found with no violence or deceit in our mouths, that we would walk through the affliction that you call us to as we bear the cross you call us to carry this life, that we would do so in a way that would be pleasing to you and would provide those around us uh, with a, a witness of what it means to follow you faithfully. Uh, Lord, thank you for being the spotless lamb who went to the cross and paid the debt that we could not pay so that we could have the life that we do not deserve. We love you, our King, and desire for you to be glorified this day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.